Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Object Between. Shelby, you want to you kick things off this time around? Yeah. Have you got all your stuff? I have got um, too many tabs open already, but I think I maybe need a couple more, so just give me one other second to find... Uh, mm, 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 mm. Fisted. And that did. Okay. Ah, Ryan, it is good to be doing this. You know, <laughs> I, I, like, please feel free to kick me a little bit in the, the private spaces of your own head because a lot of the time when we can't do this, it's because I can't do this. But um, wow. I'm really excited about this word. Oh, delightful. And Excellent. it kind of feels like it's been a not not that I'm like you know just trudging out like dutifully trudging out words. I'm always excited about a word enough to have chosen it and researched it. But yeah. This one was just particularly delicious. Oh, nice. And it it happened. It, it sometimes the pro you know we've spoken about this lots sometimes the process of choosing words happens very organically and nicely and beautifully and sometimes you have to just make lists of words and do some donkey work and eventually a thing happens yeah. um, and this one this one just sort of like landed like a beautiful piece piece of dandelion fluff um nice on something pretty where i have been learning I've, I've been learning a lot of folk songs recently they say that it comes for you eventually and this is a funny thing i actually only heard this this recently that everybody folk music gets to everybody eventually like i, I had never really heard this until a few months ago and thought it was quite a funny kind of principle yeah. uh, but also i've always quite liked folk music it's something that you know growing up my dad used to sing and play uh, folk music and it's always been a feature of you know family parties and get togethers that sort of thing yeah so i last year at some point started to play um play well i started to go to a folk session in a pub in dundee and then i started playing and singing and, and i'm just having a tremendously good time doing those things really really excellent nice. but of course i don't know shit which is this is maybe this may be the best thing about the folk sessioning is that you right. don't have to know shit. Oh, that's good. Because I like I am a person who for pretty much my entire life have played music in some way, shape or form. Yeah. But it has largely been and I have largely been about um performing, being good, getting things right, not getting things wrong. Panic, 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 stress, stress, stress. Right, yeah. Which is like severely not fun. Almost the opposite of fun. Just about. So it was like, well, yeah, I really love this thing, but also it's sort of terrible. Um, so I did that in a variety of contexts throughout my kind of childhood, teenage, 20s, even as far as that. I eventually got to a point where I was like, this all fucking sucks. I hate it. I don't right. feel like this anymore. I'm not going to do that thing anymore. The end. And for a long time, I just didn't do any, didn't do anything musical apart from singing along to the radio. Yeah. I also, because I am a dickhead, um, <laughs> I was always a bit like sneery about singing because like, I can sing. You can sing. Most people can sing to some right. degree. Yeah. I'm totally a person who believes that everybody should sing. Yeah. And, like, for a long time I've been the person saying, everyone can sing, everybody should sing, singing's glorious. But also remember there's the part of me with a red pen who has no friends. So yeah. there's that's always kind of been a bit of a, a clash, you know, like, 
with, within my brain. Um, anyway, so the folk session is run by this wonderful man called Brian. Now, I do not know Brian outside the confines of this little pub in Dundee that I'd never been in before until I went along to hear the folk session. Right. Brian plays the banjo and the fiddle and the tin whistle and the mandolin. And I feel like there's probably more instruments lurking somewhere around oh, probably. about him. You know, yeah. it's like at any point he might just, you know, produce a double bass. I don't know. Yeah. It could happen. And Brian really, really loves playing music with other people. And he really encourages everybody else to love it as much as he does. And it's incredibly welcoming and really lovely. And just it's it's just been delightful. So it started off with my friend said, oh, Amy should sing a song. And Brian said, oh, are you a singer? As though I was like Elvis. <laughs> right, yeah, and yeah. I was like, oh, well, you know, like yeah, I have, have been known to do some singing, I suppose. Yeah. So I uh, one week I uh, had some courage juice and I sang some songs, and nice. it was it was brilliant. And I've been going along ever since. So anyway, but also I I I don't know shit. So a lot of the session is like <laughs> like tunes, you know, fiddle type tunes. Yeah. And I don't don't play the violin. I did for about three months when I was eight, um, and. I don't really play another instrument well enough to just like rock out a million traditional Scottish and Irish tunes. Like, right. because nobody just does that. Obviously, you have to spend a lot of hours learning how yeah. to do it. It's not a real and thing. And that's not been the direction of my kind of musical studies thus far. But I'm working on it. Anyway, so I was like, well, you know, I could, I could take my guitar, I suppose. I, just after Christmas, I bought myself what I call the, the tiny piano. It's a little portable uh, Roland electric piano. It's just a wee, it's not a, a full length um, electric piano, which makes yeah. it very portable and it's really good fun. But the the point is I'm busking for three hours during this folk session. Make nice. so many mistakes. Sometimes well, play entire sets where, where at, we get to the end and they're like, no, 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 dude, A minor. And I'm like, oh, Oh but yeah. Also, like, just, just fine. Nobody cares. Just, just play the thing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that's awesome. It is. It's. It's so. I, I cannot tell you how much happiness it is bringing me. It's great. Um, the last time I was there, I said to Brian, "You know, there's only one thing I don't like about this," and he was like, "Oh no, what's that?" It's like it's only once a month. That's a shame. I wish it was yeah. more. So. I've been I've been learning various songs and listening to various things and you know it's been taking up some of my time all the rest of it and I I learned this really really beautiful song a few weeks ago initially because of uh, a Scottish band called the Corries now my dad was a massive fan of the Corries the Corries were part of the kind of sixties seventies folk revival in the UK and um, particularly in Scotland and the Corries comprised um, Roy Williamson and Ronnie the other guy Ronnie whose name I always forget. Jesus, that's annoying. It was in my head. As soon as I started talking, it was yeah, gone. Just evaporates. Um, Roy Roy Williamson wrote Flower of Scotland, the song that, that we sing at sporting events and which, okay. you know, isn't the national anthem of Scotland because we're not a sovereign nation, but kind of is. But sort of is, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so this this beautiful song, and I discovered very quickly that it's one of these songs that is as old as dirt. Nobody knows where it's come from. It's it's there forever. And it's it's cool, this stuff. It's kind of like etymology. It's yeah. very much like folk etymology because there are just so many parts to it that no one's ever going to know these answers. And uh, last Saturday, I was at... Uh, well, we, my friends and I and my husband, we went to Glasgow for uh, a weekend of Celtic Connections, which is a musical festival that happens in, in Glasgow every January and February. And we saw some awesome music. And one of the bands that we saw are called Lancome. They're an Irish band based in Dublin. And one of the members of Lancome has a podcast about folk songs. And each episode is just a different folk song. And him looking at all the different versions, how they relate to each other, how they differ, how they've changed through history. And I was like, wait a minute. Hang on. That's very I know cool. this. <laughs> like, I love this. This yeah. is like the two things I like best at the moment, all in one delicious, juicy package. 
So that's fantastic. Um, obviously, I can't remember what it's called because you know how much detail right. I retain about podcasts. But uh, <laughs> but I will look that up so that yeah. if anybody is interested in this very very delicious podcast with uh, the wonderful Mystery and Lynch. Anyway, send it to me. God, this is a big notes. diversion, even for me. Um, so this song is called "The Lowlands of Holland," right? Okay. And it contains the line several times. But the lowlands of Holland have twined my love and me, right? Okay. And the the, the song is about a woman whose uh, lover has gone to sea and has died. Right, the lowlands right. of Holland have twined. He twined my love and me, and it, it's one of these like, it's I'm I'm learning a version that's in Scots. There are versions in English too. There are various different traditions associated with it, and I immediately knew what those words meant without really thinking about what they meant. And then I started to think about what the words actually were, and was like hmm, twined, because usually you think about twine, like to tie things together. Yeah, you know, like that sort of twine. I'm like, but but clearly this word means apart. You know that they've they've pulled us apart. And so I thought, oh, I I guess it's a bit like the word between. It's probably got something in common with the word between. And right. Okay. That makes sense. In order to satisfy my curiosity about this particular situation. I went off and I looked up the word between and very quickly was like, oh, I need to tell Ryan about this. Okay. <laughs> so, from the lowlands of Holland, who have twined my love and me, um, all the way on to between. And it was, again, I was so sure that you'd talked about this word already. I don't know why. I think oh, it's just right. a permanent fear that besets me these days. I think it's, but, a, yeah, um, I think it's a baseline mode for both of us, like the assumption is, I'm wasting my time. We've done this already. Yeah, and and it's almost like the more excited I am about it, the more determined I am that we must have already covered it. I should like I, I don't know I don't know what your numbers are like for this, but it's literally never happened to me that I've gotten halfway through a word and then gone and looked up and be like, nuts, we've we've done that already. Yeah, it hasn't happened. Not not halfway through. I've definitely started and like been as far as looking it up like you know getting the oed page up mm -hmm. and looking yeah, up yeah. at them online and that's when i kind of go uh... i went wait a minute and then i did <laughs> and then i and then i checked in so it's but at no point when i that was one of the ones where i had no inkling that we had done it before so basically my general rule is if i think we've done it before we're probably safe <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I, 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 look, I started in the OED. That makes makes good sense. Um, and I discovered that between's been around a hell of a long time. We've got lots of old English um, citations in the OED. And I think because of the type of word it is, you know, prepositions are pretty utilitarian words. You know, like yeah. maybe there are languages out there without prepositions. But if there are, I I find myself wondering how, <laughs> like how how does that go? But um, you know, because I I think no matter what else you're using language for, I think a pretty basic part of of what you're communicating is going to involve no, not that thing, the other thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no yeah. there, not not there, no there, God, leave it, I'll do it, <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And I, I always feel like that's that's what prepositions are about. Like, where is that thing? And as a person yeah. who spends quite a lot of my life feeling like, where is that thing? Um, you know, prepositions are important, dude. They're important to me. And so the OED says, uh, it's it's actually got, it's, it's got one of these great, huge shopping list um, usage lists. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Uh, there are more interesting things to talk about, I think. But um, so here are, here are the kind of the, the broken down kind of contents page of, of this, uh, of the meaning and use is it's a preposition with reference to simple position. So referring to a point, expressing the local relation of a point to two other things, expressing the relation of a person or thing to two or more, expressing the relation of a number, quantity, degree, referring to a line of motion, 
uh, etc etc then it has with reference to intervening space so on and so on and so on with reference to things acting conjointly or participating like a contest between with reference to separation um we've got it as a noun like an abstract space or a region occupying an intermediate position um an adverb you know being in place or in or of time but the the really key thing about this word that just hadn't ever really occurred to me, which is so fucking important, is that it needs two things. You can't yeah. be between one thing. And it's it's one of the, like it's such a rock over the head, stupid, simple thing that it, it just just never ever occurred to me. Yeah. And yeah, I know. You're like, oh, man. So I I took myself over to Etim Online just, just to see what, what was going on there, what was the jam, right. and discovered, yeah, of course, that's that's quite literally what's happening here. And then I got super duper excited because between is, it's a, a compound word and both of the compounds have pirates. Oh, because, nice. Yeah, I... I and, I, I had that very same reaction, like, oh, but, oh of course. It's made up of, uh, originally, B or by, B-I or B-Y, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, and the pirate duo, D-W-O or D-U-O, it's sometimes written. Right. So I'm going to start with the second part of the word, duo, duo, okay. which means two, <laughs> because oh. of course it does. Like, of course it ah, does. Yeah, rock over the head, simple. Yeah, all right, fair and, enough. And um, because, because, of course, you need two things to be between things. And what I discovered about about duo, duo, is, well, of course, there's a million cognates because lots of things need this word. And if prepositions are that kind of very basic unit Every language has to kind of, you know, get around the problem of where things are somehow. Numbers, even more so. You know, when a word's got a number in it, it's going to yeah. see a lot of action. So we have all, all the words that have any sort of die thing going on, you know, diphthong and diploma and dichotomy. Right. And yep. then we have like words like double and doublet, dual, all, all those kind of things. But we get all... I, I, I just, I love all the sounds of these words. We get words like uh, twine. I'm going to talk about twine in just a moment. Twixt, which is very similar to be to between. Um, this one I really loved because it, it was one of these, again, rock over the head. Oh my God, can't believe I didn't see that before. But I really love that I see it now. Twig. Oh, cool. Because what does a twig do? <sighs> it takes one thing. It makes it two. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> like, well, that oh. took longer than it should have. Jeez. So, I, I, and and I just the the sheer delight for me about this word was was how often in the great rabbit hole of reading about it and researching it this happens. You're like, ah, oh, man, of course. Yeah. And um, and I I love it. It's it's like my my very most favourite. So we we get um, we get evidence for duo or duo um, in Sanskrit, in Avestan, in Greek, Latin, Old Welsh, Lithuanian, Old Church Slavonic. We are Old nice. Church Slavonic, uh, Old English, German, Gothic, Hittite, 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 Hittite as I always want to pronounce that word. Um, and they're all pretty. They either have the D or they have the TW. German has ZW, ZWI. Yeah. Um, but, but that, you know, these, these, are all, these are all pretty pretty clear, pretty straightforward. Here is the single greatest thing that I learned, however, about the pie route for two. Okay. Brace yourself. Okay, I'm braced. I love this so much. <laughs> Because, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. I've jumped the gun. I'm going to have to come back to this. Sorry. I've, I've overexcited myself and I need to come back down to earth for a minute before we get to that very exciting 
best thing. Wait, I've what? Found out. Really? What? Oh. Don't worry. I, I trust me. I okay. don't always go the right way, but I usually get somewhere close to where I was intending. Okay. All right. Now that I say that, trust me, Sims, perhaps a little bit. Well, anyway. <laughs> Let's just run with it. Yeah. We're, we're friends, right? It's, it'll be okay. Yep, we can it's do gonna it. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's all going to be fine. <laughs> um, also, I I don't have to go all the way around because I've just realised I'm, I'm talking shit about another thing. I've gotten confused with what I'm talking about. I'm going to go back, back again to the numbers. Oh, my God. It's been a fucking ride already. It has been. Um, okay. So the single greatest thing I found out about the route, the pirate for two is that one of the cognates for this pirate, Dva, duo, um, is 12, which makes sense because, you know, that number has a two in it. Except right. 12 is an interesting number, right? Yeah. Because... It is. It doesn't say 2T. It should. And 11 doesn't say 1T. It also should. And it should. And here's why it should. It should because, courtesy of the University of Texas at Austin Linguistics Research Centre, Indo-European Lexicon of Pi, Etamon and I reflexes, <laughs> yeah. um, they, they, point out, they point out that um, this Pi route gives us the word 12 and it gives us the word 2. But because the very wonderful people uh, at the University of Texas at Austin look at, at etymons and roots, not just in English, but in related languages and in older forms of, of language, they were the ones who communicated to me the wonderful, wonderful news. First of all, that in numbers like 30 and 40 and 50, etc., the TY part of that number is, in fact, it comes from a pi root. A little bit of bonus pie. Nobody ever okay. says, no, I'm sorry, I've had too much pie. Stop. No. Or if they do, we're not friends, okay? It's a red flag. <laughs> and that, the TY part, is from a pie root TIG, which means a group of 10. Okay. So, With you so far. if you have 40, you have four groups of 10. Four groups of 10. Nice. Maths in action. Awesome. So, you can have. 30, 40, 50, 60, 60, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through the T's. But, and and um, you can, the, the same thing is going on when you have the teens. So 13. Yeah. And 14. But it doesn't happen with 11 and it doesn't happen with 12. Because 11 and 12, they get, uh, they, they get a different, a different way to go. And in Germanic languages, this is often the case. And in English, which is largely a Germanic language, it's it's the same. We get instead 11. Let me tell you now that the pi root for the number one is N or L. Hmm. And the rest of the word comes from an old English word, which again translates all the way back to pi, a root that means to leave. 11 means one left over. Oh, interesting. En leofan. And 12 means two left over. Two left over. So. Oh, interesting. Du leofan. Tu leofan. 12, yeah. eventually. Yeah. And That's neat. Genuinely, even if I hadn't found out anything else cool about the word, I, I would have been like, done, the end, yeah. sorted. I That's love. awesome. And um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I, again, at this point, I went back once more to our lexicon to say, oh, but hang on, we've definitely talked about numbers before and we haven't. And honestly, I feel like I just want to do another like, 70 or so episodes where I just look at the etymology, etymology of London, <laughs> etymology of numbers because so fascinating. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was very cool. The, the 
twice tens, twice thirties, all that stuff, and the teens using that same group of ten pie route. I think I thought was really cool. But yeah, one left and two left, eleven and twelve. And where even was I? Well, we were on all the twos. There's just the lovely, lovely cognates of of that that pie route. Um, deuterium. Deuteronomy, Ooh, so they okay. they both get a, a cool little two, one going on, because deuterium, the element, is the the second place one, and oh, okay. um, Deuteronomy, of course, the the second law, um, nice. but yeah, I I just I found it incredibly good fun to go back and look at all all the uh, the d words, yeah. and. It also let me giggle at the word epididymis. Oh, that's Don't cool. Don't know if you're familiar with the word epididymis. No. Nope. E-P-I-D-I-D-Y-M-I-S. It is defined as a fleshy mass at the back of the testicles. <laughs> Ain't that sort of. Um, so, anyway. Epididymis. Wow. The two part of between is, is exactly, exactly that dude. Cool. And the other part, that's yeah. also a pirate. So I, I thought I had to go around the houses because I was confusing that pirate with the pirate for the group of ten. But um Right. Me. Got it. Okay. I've I've got myself here. Um in a roundabout way. By As we always knew or, you would. Well, a roundabout way is sort of my jam. Yeah. You have no idea how, how much I am like giggling with glee inside right now every time I say a roundabout way because the pirate B or by B H I sometimes written B I B Y is a reduced form. It's it's a an abbreviation of another pirate, and the other pirate is amb e a m b h i. They write it in uh, etym online, which means around. Oh, and you go ah oh, of course, like like ambidextrous. Yeah. Around both hands. And like um, ambiguous, you know, somewhere around about those places. Right, yeah, yeah. It also gives us all the words that, that mean, uh, that, that, that have the Latin root ambulate, you know, ambulance, perambulate, all of those things. Because presumably walking. Sorry? Somnambulate is one of my favourites. Oh, yeah, nice. Somnambulism they have here. Also, umlaut, which is just a delightful word. I like it a lot. It is a delightful word. It's very interesting because if you think about all the words that start with B, yeah. either, you know, you know, in, in, in whichever whichever way that, that goes, um, there's there's tons of them. And you're like, but do they all mean around about? Do they all mean around is that a thing? And sometimes yeah. you have to kind of jimmy that meaning in a little bit. Right, yeah. But not generally speaking. You know, it's it's uh I I started off thinking, mm, I'm not sure I'm not sure how convinced I am with that, but yeah, actually all good. Interesting. And so the the compound between comes from the word meaning around. And the the pirate meaning two. Um, you've got to be around two things to be in between two things. Um, and then of course there's there's my um, my folk song that I, I started off with in the first place, because right. twine does indeed mean two things. It's it's right there in the list of cognates in both the uh, University of Texas and the Etym Online. Um, lists of, of cognates is yeah. defined as a, a strong thread made from twisted strands um, sometimes spelled twin without the E and right. from that from that exact same root you know pretty, pretty straightforward but then of course I remembered that I was in the world of Scots etymology not English etymology and so I might oh, need okay. to look um, I might need to look slightly slightly differently so I went off to the, the excellent dictionary of the Scots language. I, I don't know if... You've probably never had particular cause to visit the site, 
but it's it's really great. It's it's not quite the OED of Scots, but it's it's not a bad um it's it's a really, really good resource yeah. to have around about you. Um and I found that there's there's twine and there's twine, one with an E and one without an E, but both pronounced in the same way. Oh, okay. And I thought I thought I'd let you hear. I thought I'd let you hear some of the the, the different usages. So there's there's a variety yep. of usages, and they they all feel very, um, they all feel very Scots. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. So the first one's about sheep. <laughs> well, we're right there on track already. Here we go. <laughs> Like, I'm going to smash some stereo to, oh, not today. No, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> uh, not today. So in, in <clears throat> this sense, uh, twine, to take a lamb from a weak or sickly ewe and put it to a strong ewe, which is able to suckle it along with her own lamb. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So take it out and, and take it away from its mum when it's not going to thrive and put it in with another one. So th there is, you know, this, this sense that we get in the, the second usage for this particular word to divide or separate or sunder or part. And in fact, the first citation that's given here is uh, the Lowlands of Holland, He Twined My Love and Me, that very song that started me off in the same place. Yeah. And if, if a twig is going to... Uh, divide the, the branch into two parts, then you, you can see that a twine is, you know, it, it, it keeps coming back to that, that two-ness, if you like. Yeah. It can also mean simply to divide up or share out, uh, especially when you're talking about wealth, you know, twining your money. Um, and there's a usage that also says, again, this could possibly apply to the folk song usage too, it's to deprive someone of something, to separate them from something in order, like on purpose, um, sort of with malice. Right. So hmm. from twining to between with a, a roundabout uh, by in the way, I also yeah. discovered uh, that the reason that the reason that I got such a fright when the voice of God appeared in my ear there is because I I had taken advantage of the, the slight pause to look up a, a book that I I just keep forgetting exists. And I don't know what I'm I'm gonna tell you what this book is and you're gonna make excited noises and oh, then okay. you're gonna be absolutely aghast that I for some reason I had to look up a word that I didn't find in the OED. Oh. And I found it and it really, I, I can't, I can't remember the exact circumstances that led me to going on to World of Books, which is a great second-hand online bookshop that I, mm. I use a lot. It's probably owned by Amazon because everything else seems to be, but I, I hope is. not. Um, and I saw this book and was like, oh, I'm having that. I'm, I'm having that. And I'm going to use it for every single Lexa texture here on out. And I've, this is the first time, literally the first time I've even mentioned it to you. Yeah. The book is called The Sailor's Word Book. Oh, you know what? I have Do you that. Have this book? Hey! I found, I found it in a used bookstore in Ottawa while I was at school, so about four years ago, and I went, I'll have that. I'll be having that. And I, I'm very gratified to know that it's it's also by Smith. Oh, I didn't know that. Admiral I didn't W. Notice H. So much. Smith. Smith with a Y, because, you know, spelling's for losers. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> And it's so it's the Sailor's Word book, the classic source for over 14,000 nautical and naval terms, including some more especially military and scientific, but useful to seamen, as well as arche archaisms of early voyagers, etc. Interesting. Yeah, it's so cool. And yeah, it is. It's just it's a super duper cool word uh, book. I, I, I really love it. And it's got. Uh, where is my cognate list? I had it a second ago. Yeah, but then the long list of cognates of Ambi, that ex uh, full form of the the pi root that gives us the by the b part of between. One of the cognates is the word abaft, a b a f t. Oh, interesting. And yeah, I I'd never heard the word abaft before. No. And when I looked it up, I discovered that it's a nautical term. And at that point, I went, oh, hey, remember how I have that giant book of nautical? Yeah. Like, it's a giant sea dictionary. Maybe use that. So 
here is what Admiral Smith has to say about the word abaft. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I really love this word because it's, it's a word that could be useful, but it's only, it only ever seems to have been used in this one particular, very specific context. That's cool. So Smith says this, this word, generally speaking, means behind, inferred relatively, beginning from the stem and continuing towards the stern. That is the hinder part of the ship. Abaft the beam implies any direction between a supposed transverse line amidships and the stern, whether in or out of the ship. It is the relative situation of an object with the ship when that object is placed in the arc of the horizon, contained between a line at right angles with the keel and the point of the compass which is directly opposite the ship's course. An object, as a man overboard, is described by the lookout man at the masthead as a beam before or abaft the beam by so many points of the compass, as a vessel seen maybe three points before the beam, etc. Right. Yeah, that wow. felt like a lot. Um, Etym Online yeah. says it in or farther towards the back part of a ship of a ship, excuse me, as opposed to forward. And um, it, it is itself a, a compound word. The B, by part, and eftan, which is a word that gives us the word aft, as in for and aft. And aft means from behind, in, near, okay. or towards the stern of a ship. Um, so abaft is behind the behind you know uh, yeah, towards yeah. the towards the aft part around about the the aft part i suppose um but yeah d depending on where that that imaginary line has drawn and i just i just love sailory words they're they're cool i've got another one that i was going to talk about but i'm actually i'm kind of tempted to leave it for a separate episode because it's such a cool word but it also no, I'm, I, no I'm, I've got absolutely no way of delaying gratification. You know what I'm like. Here's, here's what I'm talking about. In the, in the Etym Online definition, it says, the, the word has been saved by the sailors, the stern being the after part of a vessel, the lubbers having left it in Middle English. Oh, nice. Okay. And you'll have heard this word before. Usually it's landlubber, yeah? Yeah. Do you know what this word means? I think I always just assumed that it was a kind of a um, imitative, like it was land lovers, but land lovers, like that's what I just yeah, sort of assumed. That's that what it, everybody thinks. You think it's, it's about a person who loves the land, but that's not what this word means. So here's okay. here's what Smith here's what Smith has in his, his definition, um, and there's there's actually. <laughs> There are five definitions that, that relate to this. So, lubber or lubart, he has A-R-T at the end. An awkward, unseaman-like fellow, from a northern word implying a clownish dolt. A bosun wow. defined them as, quote, fellows fitted with teeth longer than their hair, end quote. Jeez. <laughs> Alluding to their appetites. <laughs> wow. So, that... so a lubber, a lubber's just a, an idiot. I, I, I do enjoy the word dolt, and um, dolt is good. Uh, Smith Smith follows that with lubberland hyphenated, not a water park. Although it totally sounds like it could be. Yeah. Ahoy there, lubberland! A kind of El Dorado in a sea story, a country of pleasure without work, all sharing alike. <laughs> Jeez. It would seem that the, the uh, sailors considered such a land to be crazy. Um, Just lunacy. <laughs> then we have Lubber's Hole. The vacant space between the head of a lower mast and the edge of the top, so turned from timid climbers preferring that as an easier way for getting to the top than trusting themselves to the futtock shrouds. The term has been used for any cowardly evasion of duty. Whoa. <laughs> this is wow. I don't know what futtock shrouds are either, 
I could find out in this book, but I don't know if the podcast Amy looks things up in a C dictionary is is like entirely. I you know what I'm already there. <laughs> I feel like I feel like we have the makings of just a a good just a default way for you to do solo episodes for when we just like can't get together. It's just like Amy, just hit record and just start reading that dictionary, and we'll so, have like three and a half to seventeen hours worth of. <laughs> Futics are uh, I, I can't say the word futic without laughing. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I should be better than this and I'm not. No, you should uh, Futics are the separate pieces of timber which compose the frame presumably of a boat. There are four futics component parts of the rib and occasionally five to a ship. <sighs> The timbers that constitute her breadth, the middle division of a ship's timbers, or those parts which are situated between the floor and the top timbers, separate timbers which compose the frame. Those next to the keel are called ground futtocks or naval timbers, and the rest upper futtocks. And then futtock shrouds, which uh, were referenced to uh, in, in the lubber, the lubber hole definition. Futtock shrouds are short pieces of rope or chain which secure the lower dead eyes and futtock plates of top mast rigging to a band around a lower mast. Um, interestingly, oh, I, I, it's there, it's there in both. I just didn't notice it in the first one. Futtocks is a, a, a contraction of foot hooks, but I know which one we prefer. Well, yeah, of course. Foot hooks are good, but also they do not sound like buttock. No. Um, and therefore they're lame. Wow. Yeah. So I, I is... yeah, as as a as a, a lubber, uh, or indeed as as anybody else, you can place yourself between the the two concealing parts of the lubber hole. You can place yourself between um, the pages of the sailor's word book for endless hours of entertainment. You can place yourself between uh, the love in the song and the singer in the song and our lover. And I've just had a tremendously good fun time looking at the word between. That was... Wow. It, and ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very short guided tour of the inner workings of Amy's brain. <laughs> In case oh, anyone... oh dude. dude, there's so much more. <laughs> I, d I didn't say it was comprehensive. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this does. Yeah, this does feel like a very. It's yeah. That's. I hope you know that I've. I hope you know I've shown you things that not everybody sees. It's. <laughs> I it's mean, been a I'm journey. pretty sure. I'm pretty sure most people who spend any sort of time listening to me know that that's the sort of. That's kind of how it works. But, I feel like yeah. it's more confirmation than revelation. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's good to have closure oh, to the questions. And this is why we're friends. This is, this, uh, <laughs> that's a heck of a thing. It's, it's interesting because it, it, at most of the turns of that journey, the, I, picked, I, I picked the wrong way to predict it was going to go. Like... Um, so when we got to like the, the, the reason twine is called twine, like the, the heavy duty string to tie things together, my brain went, well, it, it's because it connects two things. If you're tying things together with twine, you're, but it's, but it's about how, like the fact that it's a, a, a um, braided, you know, like it's, it's how many yeah, fibers are in to make it strong. Yeah, they literally like double thread or twisted thread. Yeah. Yeah. And like the when you're talking about the um twining for like the the lamb with the sickly mom. Yeah. I went to well, of course, because you're bringing the lamb to a new mother and putting together two things that will work together and but it's not about that, it's about the other side of it, the division that happens I before guess, it Ryan, gets you're just you. You just love division, and I just love bringing people together. This is, one of us does one of those. It's, I don't, I, I'm lost as to which one is which at this point. I don't really know what it is. But uh, oh, oh, the great irony of of me being the person to say that to you. So, someone does something anyway. Someone does a thing, and someone maybe does a different thing that's not that thing, but is similar. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. No, but 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 also like 
like I kept saying about, you know, rock over the head, obvious stuff. Because what's more simple than putting two things together? Like it's it's it, it kind of this feels to me like getting down in the mud, you know? Yeah. Getting down in the mud of words because this idea, this concept is as old as lang you know, must be even oh, oh, everything's older than language, but like when it comes to knowing where things are, like prepositions have to be there in a language because even if the word even if they don't exist as words within a language, that the concept has to be there because, you know, we exist in space and as people yeah. we need to know where things are. But also we cannot exist by ourselves. So two things have to be there. Just you know, you, you can't be between anything if there if there's only one of those things. But there are so many ways, both literal, physical and the huge realm of kind of figurative uses of of putting two things together or taking two things apart that I, I'm not surprised in any way that you're like oh I I, I was going for the wrong thing you know well it's a it's such a basic simple thing to happen it's easy to see how you could go the other way you know it's it's almost yeah. like 50 50 chance <laughs> like there well, are two it, ways yeah. to go <laughs> like so yeah cool so I have a relatively short uh, entry, which I guess is is just Pro well. probably not a terrible thing. Given um, the, <laughs> like, sort of feel like that might have been therapy. <laughs> yeah. So this word, my word is object or Ooh. object, and it's cool the reason title. I wanted to. The reason I wanted to to look at this is because you know like how in English we have these thing where. There's a lot of pairs of words, a noun and a verb, where they're, they're spelled the same. They mean very similar things, but the stress goes on the front or back to denote whether it's a verb or a noun. So uh, a desert or to desert. I am having you produce, the craziest, produce. craziest deja vu right now. I am sure we've had a conversation about this before. Or maybe I've read about it recently, or or something. Well, so we into so this. Continue. we did we did the word produce a while ago, and to like record, and you record on a record. So it's yes. the if the emphasis is on the second syllable, it's the verb, and the yes. noun gets the emphasis on the first. So produce, produce, you know. But except no one in this country says produce. No. Well, produce. Yeah. Oh no, we do. Yeah, produce. I think it was just the your accent rather than the. Yeah, we do use that word. It's very unusual. Okay. Like, yeah, not not a commonly used word. I I would. You know what? I'm going to shut up and let you talk. Okay. <laughs> So this one seemed weird, though, because it didn't seem immediately clear what the two versions of this word had to do with one another. Uh -huh. So an object, a, a thing, mm -hmm. or to object, you know, you find something unfavorable or the way you know, we do, to express an adverse or dissenting reason. Um, th I, those didn't make any sense to me to be the same thing. So I was like... But it follows that same pattern. So I was like, this, it should fall into the same category, but, but does it? So I said, let's find out. Um, let's. So both forms of the word go back in English about as far as your average Latin French origin word does. So it's right around the turn of the 15th century. Okay. Um, end of the 13s, beginning of the 1400s. Um, the noun shows up in the OED about 25 years earlier than the verb. So, I mean, when you're talking about standard <laughs> 1400, 25 years doesn't mean anything at all. So it's, yeah. they were definitely being used at the same time. Uh, the earliest OED citation for the verb, so to object, was 1425. And the OED says that originally it meant, quote, to dissent, to state an objection or an adverse or dissenting reason. I so, and I thought this was a bit weird because I, I didn't see that being as hugely different to the way it's used today. So the idea that it said originally it meant this, I thought, 
Well, yes. But doesn't it still? It still does, more? but it originally yeah. did too. It's like a Mitch Hedberg thing. Um, the OED goes on to say, uh, quote, later frequently to express or feel disapproval or reluctance to disapprove, to disagree. So I think originally it was more of a, it was more of formal term, like a, like a rhetorical term. I like object, a very, Your Honor. Yeah, yeah, you had a, a technical meaning to it and there was a, a formal sense of it that sort of got lost. So anyway, that's, so that's the verb. 1425, meaning that. The noun is cited around 1398, and it, it also kind of underwent a broadening, uh, a broadening over time. So now it just kind of means a, a thing, like a, a physical thing that exists in physical space. You can interact with it. You can see it. The way the OED defines it is a material thing that can be seen and touched. But originally, the OED definition is something placed before or presented to the eyes or other senses. And again, Ooh. you kind of go, okay, but those are, I mean, what's the difference there? Oh no, but, I, I think they're very different. But when you, but but then you kind of, where where I clued in was the fact that it was the something placed before or presented to the eye. So it's about the the placing, because when you and of course when you object to something, you are you have to present that objection. You have to put it before whoever it is you're talking to. Okay. And then you can address it. So the to object. You're presenting the objection as an object for the other person's consideration. Uh, right? Nice. Okay. Etymology wise, uh, they're both Latin and they both come from uh, a Latin compound with ob as a prefix meaning in front of, towards, or against, and yacare meaning to throw. So, the ject in object or object is the same ject as with reject, eject, inject, abject. Oh, nice. All those other jects. And <laughs> all it's those because jects. of. The, we know those guys. Be, <laughs> all those jects. <laughs> so it's. Everything hinges on that something in the original OED definition, something placed before or presented to the eyes or other senses. And you can totally see how that would it would lose that that sense of it would get overshadowed by the thing itself. Yeah, yeah. The sure. fact that it was placed somewhere it, that that feels very minor compared to the thing that's there. Because Who cares how it if, got there? Let's deal with yeah, it. Yeah, like if someone if someone brings you a, a pineapple that you've never seen before, you immediately lose interest in the person who's brought it and go, oh, what's the thing? Yeah. Yeah. And it, that seems uh, yeah. to me to make sense. And so it, that that broadening of dropping the, the sense of being placed or thrown down or whatever uh -huh. gets lost. But in fact, it's exactly the same as uh, object and object are exactly the same as produce, produce, record, record, desert, Desert, uh, desert or desert because it's an object is the thing that was thrown down and to object is to throw down something in an argument setting or in a courtroom or in whatever and the that the ject for the jects eject reject inject abject all that stuff um is transliterated as uh, y e uh. and so the first uh where i immediately went and su surprisingly or not edema online doesn't have an entry for this word uh at this point uh -huh. but i actually immediately went to the word yeet like as the kids say or probably don't say anymore because it's already been 20 minutes and they say something else now but the the Is slang that... term for to throw yeah yeah that's right to oh, yeet okay. something but it's delightful to me that that is very etymologically grounded all the way like, back yeah, you, to the pie root for throwing. You can make throwing. a case for that, can't you? <laughs> so you could actually, so 
my favorite thing is that sometime in the future, distant or otherwise, <laughs> someone is going to be doing something like this and they're going to be like, well, and then of course the word yeet comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word for throw. <laughs> and that's awesome. And neither of our holograms will be there to say, I'm sorry, that's not actually the case. Would have been cool though. <laughs> Would have been so cool. So it's it's fun it's fun to prognosticate about folk etymologies down the line. Oh, definitely, man. Because that's pretty cool. But anyway, that that's 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 all I had for that. It's just that the fact that uh I, I just I had solved that little mystery for myself and was quite happy with that, with the fact that it is in fact part of that bundle of English words that does that thing where the verb gets one stress and the noun gets another stress, and the two words that didn't seem related at all are in fact very closely related in siblings. Super cool. Also, more and more, like, I I, <laughs> I was talking to a friend earlier on today about how um, I, I used to I used to hate when I did things that everybody else was doing. You know, I think I I wanted to like prefer to believe yeah. that I was my own precious little snowflake doing unique things throughout the world. And and now I kind of love when I do the opposite of that. Like like the pandemic was a really good example of this this sort of phenomenon that I'm talking about. Like I completely spontaneously, uninfluenced by anything else, decided independently myself that I wanted to take up sewing during the pandemic. Right. Except, no, I fucking didn't, obviously. Except so did 750 million other people all at once. Yeah. Do, do you know how easy it was to buy a sewing machine during uh, said pandemic? It was pretty much impossible. Was, I eventually yeah. got my hands on a sewing machine from uh, my cousin's wife, who had one in her garage that she wasn't okay. using. Because literally the whole world does like the same things as well. at the bread same was time. A big thing thinking that they are special little snowflakes doing their own, like forging their own path. And there's, there's a, I, I sort of love that. Like I say, I, I used to be like, no, I'm, I'm better than that sort of, like, basically I, I'm like, I'm better than other humans, but I'm yeah. less of a dickhead now than I used to be. I, I mean, at least a bit. And so <laughs> I, I, I quite, I quite enjoy when I'm like, oh, I'm buying the same things that all the other people are buying to do the same things that we're all doing. We're all super basic together. And I love that. Cheers, yeah. humans. But, um, and the, the, the sort of, there's, there's something weirdly comforting about this idea that we all just, like, we're all just kind of animals, really, and we're, we're quite predictable in a lot of ways. And so there's, there's nothing that says that to me more. Like, nothing in the world says that to me more than the idea that the, the kind of evolution of this, of this situation has been, like, Somebody going, here's a thing. Yeah. And you being like, oh, a thing. And taking that thing from them with your hands to feel it and look closer, you know, look with yeah. your eyes, not your hands. Fuck off. That's I right. love yeah, to look yeah. at things with my hands. Yeah, of course. Um, and so what's the next thing you do with that thing? You throw it at something. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> look at this that's... icicle I found. Smash. That's what humans do. <laughs> yeah. Always have, always will. <laughs> Take thing, look at thing, throw thing. Repeat. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Yeah, that is, that's super cool. Also, uh, I, I mean, not in any way linguistically, etymologically uh, relevant, but what what it reminds me of when you talk about these these different pairs of words, like, you know, reduce and produce and, and yeah and produce and, and all these kinds of things is it, it makes me think of the sphinx from mystery men okay now do you, I'm... Do, you do you remember mystery men I, I i i know the film i know that i did see it oh it's very foggy it's one of, it's one of these films that i put on when i'm sad you know i just I, it's, oh, okay yeah yeah it's just incredibly funny and the <laughs> so this <laughs> if, if you haven't seen the film it's about a group of superheroes who aren't particularly super trying to get superer and um and along the way they um they encounter this mysterious character called the sphinx and <laughs> the sphinx has 
<laughs> he has a long cloak and a wise face. And he says things like, uh, <laughs> like learn to hide your strikes from your opponent and you're, you'll more easily strike his hide. He who questions training <laughs> only trains himself at asking questions. And um, at, at, <laughs> so at one point, um, the, the, the rage character... Um, Mr. Furious, God, uh, he he loses basically loses his shit at him and, and takes the piss out of the fact that all of his kind of inspirational quotes are basically just uh, you know taking the same thing and then changing it around. Like when yeah. you doubt your powers, you give power to your doubts. And he's right. like, "Oh yeah, yeah, very good, yeah, great, yeah, oh yeah. brilliant, well done." Are these even inspirational quotes? <laughs> and, <laughs> and there's yeah, there's there's just something about that. Object and object that yeah, brings it to my mind. Nice. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.